The Battle of Christosis was the first battle we got to see in Star Wars The Clone Wars, and over the course of the show's first few seasons, it was revisited several times. This can make piecing together the full chronology of the battle somewhat difficult. Even if you watch the appropriate episodes in chronological order, they don't quite lead into each other, and there's parts of the battle that happen mostly off screen that can be easily forgotten. In this video, we're going to be analysing the naval aspect of this early war battle, a crucial theatre that's too often overlooked. Attention, Sergeant on deck! Late in 22 BBY, as Separatist forces pushed Rimward down the Corellian run, they decided to occupy the neutral planet of Christosis a strategically important world on the run that acted as a gateway between the mid and outer rims. Long term, the Confederacy hoped to cut Republic forces moving down the run off the outer rim, and they sought to use Christosis as a staging ground for assaults on Kamino and Rathana, two of the Grand Army of the Republic's most crucial fortress worlds. In the short term, the Confederacy wanted Christosis's abundant mineral resources, especially its vast deposits of crystals, and capturing the planet would also give them a chance at capturing or killing Republic Senator Bail Organa, who ran a refugee camp in the planet's capital city. The Confederacy, recognizing the many strategic benefits of taking Christosis, invested heavily in taking and keeping the planet. Two of the Confederacy's greatest commanders, Admiral Trench of the CIS Navy and General Warm Loathsome of the Retail Caucus, were assigned to capture the planet and they brought massive fleets and armies for the job. Trench struck first, leading a fleet of over 30 capital ships in establishing a blockade of Christosis, following which Loathsome landed his droid armies, a massive force composed of innumerable battle droids and tanks. It didn't take long for Loathsome's forces to occupy most of the planet. A few pockets of resistance endured. Some of the Christosians resisted, and a few small detachments of clone troopers from the 13th Sector Army fought tooth and nail to defend Senator Organa, who was trapped on the planet by Trench's blockade. With such a well-respected Republic Senator trapped on Christosis, Trench and Loathsome knew it would only be a matter of time before the Republic struck back and attempted to take the planet, or at least rescue Senator Organa. As Loathsome fortified his positions on the surface, Admiral Trench arrayed his ships in standard blockade formation above the city Caledonia, the Republic's likely attack vector. Then, all he had to do was wait, but not for very long. It didn't take more than a few days for the Republic to attempt its first assault on the Christosis blockade. The fleet Trench had in position above Christosis was nothing to scoff at. The Admiral himself personally commanded the blockade from the Providence-class Dreadnought Invincible, which was supported by at least 12 Lucre Hulk-class battleships, at least one Recusant-class light destroyer, and at least 19 Munificent-class star frigates, at least 33 capital ships in all. This was a fleet with incredible firepower. Trench's blockade formation allowed the Invincible and those Munificents to make the most of their powerful forward guns and all those Lucre Hulk battleships were armed to the teeth. The sheer number of Lucre Hulk battleships, which was considerably more than the Confederacy mustered for most Clone Wars naval battles, also meant that Trench's fleet had an absurd number of starfighters to support it. At minimum, this fleet had over 18,000 Vulture droids to throw into the fray, and that's assuming that only the battleships were carrying starfighters. Trench's flagship also had a squadron or two of the Confederacy's brand new Hyena-class bombers. To break this massive blockade, the newly promoted General Anakin Skywalker brought, in total, three Venator-class Star Destroyers and three Pelter-class frigates. Skywalker had the support of Admiral Ularan, who commanded the fleet from the bridge of the Resolute, but he was still hilariously outmatched. This went about as well as you might expect. Skywalker didn't get completely wiped off the map, since most of the blockade held its position and let the Invincible do the heavy lifting, but he still lost a frigate and suffered critical damage to one of his Star Destroyers before being forced to retreat behind Christosis' moon. There, his fleet was joined by a fourth Star Destroyer, the Negotiator, the flagship of General Obi-Wan Kenobi. Kenobi, fortunately for the Christosians, had a better plan than Skywalker, 
much to the surprise of no one at all. He had brought along a state-of-the-art IPV2C stealth corvette, which he hoped could run trenches blockade and deliver supplies to Senator Organa, buying the Republic Navy more time to clean house in orbit. Skywalker and Admiral Yularen took command of the stealth ship for this mission, but as they slipped through the blockade, Trench got tired of waiting for the Republic to launch another attack, and he dispatched his hyena bombers to increase pressure on Senator Organa's command center. The bombers brought Organa's forces to the brink of collapse, and with time running short, Kenobi rallied what remained of the Republic fleet, planning to attack the blockade again while the stealth ship continued with its mercy mission. But Skywalker advocated against this plan of attack, as Kenobi's offense would never succeed against the sheer firepower of Trench's fleet. Instead, Skywalker used the stealth ship to engage the Invincible directly, playing a game of cat and mouse with Trench that he hoped would distract the Separatists from the fight on the surface. Ultimately, Skywalker was able to lead Trench's own tracking torpedoes into the Invincible's bridge while the warship shields were down, causing a chain reaction that crippled the ship and seemingly killed Admiral Trench. The sudden loss of the Invincible threw the Separatist blockade into disarray, giving the Republic fleet an opening to attack. From the bridge of the Negotiator, Kenobi was able to punch a hole in the blockade and land armies of clone troopers on Caledonia. He and Skywalker helped Senator Organa and his remaining troops escape and then took command of the ground battle, while Admiral Yularen took command of Republic naval forces, which soon received some much needed reinforcements. But the battle over Christosis didn't end there. The Invincible, which had proven very vincible indeed, was out of commission. But the other 30 odd ships and trenches fleet were still intact. And once their commanders established a new chain of command, the true space battle began. Fortunately for Admiral Yularen, more Republic ships were on the way. The core of the Republic fleet swelled from four Venator class Star Destroyers to at least seven including the flagship Resolutes and the Star Destroyers Negotiator and Dauntless. At least four acclimated class assault ships also joined the fight, and the remaining two Pelter class frigates were joined by a slew of other support ships, including a supply vessel named the Hunter. To deal with the Separatist fleet's vast swarms of Vulture droids, the Republic deployed thousands of V-19 Torrent Starfighters and Delta 7B Light Interceptors. Republic naval forces were still outnumbered, but the odds had been evened a little. With the assistance of a Jedi Knight, Republic bombers were able to take out the Separatists Recrescent class destroyer and one of its Lucre Hulk battleships, giving Yularen's fleet a vital opening that allowed the Admiral to eliminate several of the Separatists' cruisers. From then on, the battle was more of an even fight, but it rapidly descended into total chaos with what had once been an orderly blockade losing all sense of cohesion. The scene above Christosis became reminiscent of one that would take shape above Coruscant two and a half years later. Capital ships scattered every which way, firing on each other with little organization or cohesion, as vast swarms of starfighters filled the space between. The disorder was made worse by sudden fluctuations in Christosis' sun, which caused intermittent communications blackouts. Both sides suffered heavy casualties in the ensuing days-long naval battle. Yularen lost many of his ships, but he took out quite a few of the confederacies as well, and starfighters on both sides were destroyed in the thousands. Toward the end of the naval battle, as the tide shifted back and forth on the planet's surface, Yularen lost a good chunk of his support fleet, interrupting the flow of supplies and reinforcements to the Republic's ground armies. From there, the situation only worsened and the naval battle might have been lost entirely were it not for the sudden arrival of reinforcements. Grandmaster Yoda arrived at the 11th hour with additional Star Destroyers and assault ships, which rapidly turned the tide and forced what was left of Trench's fleet to abandon Christosis. By that time, the battle on the surface had mostly been won. General Loathsome had been captured, and with the landing of Yoda's reinforcements, what was left of his army was crushed. The Republic had won. So that's our look at the naval theater of the Battle of Christosis. But what do you think? Are there other naval battles from Star Wars The Clone Wars you'd like us to talk about? Free to post your thoughts in the comments section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.